Welcome to the second of a seven-part series on anticoagulants. In this video, we discuss vitamin K antagonists. Let's begin with the following take-home points. Vitamin K antagonists inhibit factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and protein C and S. Vitamin K antagonists should be reversed with four-factor prothrombin complex concentrates and vitamin K. Low-dose vitamin K, given daily, can help stabilize fluctuating INRs. Let's first discuss vitamin K-dependent gamma carboxylation. A vitamin K-dependent coagulation factor starts out in an inactive state with a glutamic acid residue. Through an enzymatic reaction, the glutamic acid residue is converted to GLA or glamacarboxyglutamic acid. This conversion activates a coagulation factor, allowing its binding to calcium and phospholipids in support of coagulation. Vitamin K dependent factors include 2, 7, 9, and 10, and the natural anticoagulants protein C and protein S. The conversion of the inactive coagulation factor to its active state requires the action of gamma glutamyl carboxylase. For this reason, gamma glutamyl carboxylase needs its cofactor, vitamin K hydroquinone or KH2. KH2 is produced when vitamin K epoxide is reduced to form the hydroquinone. Vitamin K epoxide is reduced by the enzyme vitamin K epoxide reductase, or VKOR. This process is facilitated by vitamin K. For this reason, it is the vitamin K cycle. Vitamin K antagonists act by blocking vitamin K epoxide reductase, thus stopping production of vitamin K hydroquinone and inhibiting gamma glutamyl carboxylase. As a consequence, vitamin K-dependent factors cannot be activated. The cycle can be restored by adding vitamin K, which cancels the effect of the vitamin K antagonist. Alternatively, the cycle can be restored by direct addition of the vitamin K-dependent factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. These factors are found in concentrated form in four-factor prothrombin complex concentrates. They are also available in dilute form in FFP or fresh frozen plasma. The effect of vitamin K antagonists on the vitamin K dependent factors is measured by the International Normalized Ratio or INR. An INR goal of 2.0 to 3.0 provides the right balance of anticoagulation without excess bleeding complications. In the first few hours to days of initiation, vitamin K antagonists rapidly lower protein C levels, producing an initial increase in hypercoagulability. Levels of factor 7, which have the shortest half-life, which has the shortest half-life, are also rapidly lowered, causing a quick INR elevation that does not yet reflect true anticoagulation. The attainment of therapeutic anticoagulation takes about five days. For this reason, vitamin K antagonists must initially overlap with another anticoagulant such as heparin. Vitamin K antagonists have a half-life of about 20 to 60 hours. Vitamin K antagonists are ind indicated in the treatment of arterial and venous thrombosis, anticoagulation of mechanical bowels, in the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and end-stage renal disease. They are not the anticoagulant of choice for cancer-associated thrombosis. A big challenge in warfarin management is INR fluctuations. Fluctuations occur when there is low dietary vitamin K intake, vitamin K deficiency, and or the effect of medications. These medications that are metabolized by the hepatic enzyme cytochrome P450 affect warfarin metabolism. In stable outpatients for whom the effects of medication are not a factor, INR fluctuations can be treated with low-dose vitamin K daily. In summary, vitamin K antagonists inhibit factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 in protein C and S. 
vitamin K antagonists should be reversed with four-factor prothrombin complex concentrates and vitamin K. Low-dose vitamin K given daily can help stabilize fluctuating INRs. This ends our discussion on the class of anticoagulants known as the vitamin K antagonists.